Hello and welcome to our little Solomors Mix video. Uh, what I'm going to be doing here is telling you real basic stuff about uh, how I mix things. And now I need to preface this by saying this is geared toward DIY projects that aren't recording in a perfect environment with perfect gear. And uh, I come from a live sound background uh, before I came into doing studio stuff, um, which I came into out of necessity because it was too expensive for us to record uh, back when we first started um, at the beginning of home recording and all that so this is just uh, the very basics of how I do it and uh, hopefully it'll be useful to somebody out there but um, anyways this is kind of a um, I'd like to say the tip of the iceberg as far as the the mix is concerned but it's it's not even the tip of the iceberg it's like seeing the tip of the iceberg off in the distance and saying oh well, well I'm gonna have a whole lot of work cut out for me first step is to organize the tracks um, this is gonna help you a whole lot later on so I always do this first uh, get everything into little subgroups so for example, you might have multiple snare sounds. Our, our snare has the regular snare, it has the uh, the snap, and then uh, heavily EQ'd snap. So those three are all sent to a sub-fader that's somewhere, I don't know where it is, um, that mixes all the snares together, and then those go in a subgroup to all the drums that go over here, the drum sub, and that goes to the master fader. Um, do that with everything. So you see these are all guitars here. And they're all sub bus to a different group so I can level and EQ all the different takes of guitars separately. Um, these are set up in pairs. Everything is quad tracked here. And then I double reamped that and then have another layer over here. But um, So you can see all the uh, this snare level meters going up and down. Um, one, two, three of these are sent to one, two, three sub buses, and then they are sent over to the master guitar rhythm sub bus before that goes into the the final thing. And to make it easier on color code or uh, uh, keeping track of everything, color code the groups so that if you switch in the here and like have to do some edits on your squiggles real quick or something like that um, you know what you're looking at and it makes it much easier to find this is one of the smaller projects uh, which is why I picked it so you see there aren't too many tracks here it's real basic stuff but some of the tracks had like a hundred and hundred and some different um, different faders and that gets to be quite confusing after a while Step number two is going to be to frame out your basic EQs, and what I mean by that is you're setting the um, the high pass filter so that you're cutting out the low end slop and rumble, and basically you're just taking any non musical noise and getting rid of it so you don't have to worry about it later on. Um, so what I like to do, I mean, it, after a while you get to know the the uh, ins and the outs of where you need to set everything, and since, like I said, I came from a uh, live sound background so I'm fairly familiar with all that but um, this is just a, a little free freebie plugin from Vixango called span and it lets you see the uh, it lets you see the frequencies of what you're working with which is very nice uh, so you can go like this and we're, we're gonna solo out the bass and you can see there's a whole lot of low-end stuff here this is basically the bottom of human hearing Below like 30 or 40 for metal stuff, you don't have a whole lot musical, so we can lose all this here. All that's really doing is uh, it's going to be tripping out your compressors and, and making them pump when you get to the final master stage. So we're going to cut that slop out of there. And I already have this channel set up, but I'll, I'll pull up a um, an equalizer and show you what I do. Uh, on the bottom, just set it real steep right here and then pull it up to whatever so you can see well maybe you can see right here we're just cutting this bottom stuff out um, the fundamental frequency of the bass 
is pretty low and you're going to be losing a lot of that but you don't really need it we're worried about the first harmonics that lie right in here so i'll set it to like maybe 30 at force first or somewhere under 40 if i start to get ambitious i had the slope on this set really high um and that that'll help tame that you'll have to adjust it later but this will at least get rid of that non-musical rumble for setting up the mix um, the other thing that you're going to do is if you have anything weird and peaky down in here uh, set a real narrow filter and just start to, to sculpt some of the low end so some of that might be hum or rumble from you know the mic sitting on the ground or something like that but you just find those frequencies and cut them this is a stage where you do that because that's non-musical noise and then optionally you can sculpt the high end a little bit if you're not going to leave that alone um, we're, we'll do a little bit more of that later but if there's like non-musical hash that you don't want in there um, like this is the bass so really anything up above this range here is is going to be a lot of uh, like pick scrape and fret noise and that type of thing finger noise so you can safely cut a lot of that depending on how chimey you want your bass to be but uh, I'll, I'll be pretty timid about cutting that until we get to the tone sculpting phase but uh, you can set that you know fairly high and just get all this crap out of the way of the uh, the snap of the snare the click of the click drum here and then the cymbals that are going to be up here now the next thing we're going to do is uh, talk about frequency variable dynamics so dynamics are your compressors and that sort of thing um, frequency variable means they're uh, I'm just referring to um, you don't want to squash the full frequency range you just want to control certain frequencies that might get a little bit out of control um, I can't go into uh, too, too much of that right now but I'm going to talk about the guitars uh, because they're really the guitars and the bass are the worst offenders here um, right here in the guitar range between like 160 and you know 240 or so these this is where the guitars are going to be interfering with your uh, the meat of your drum sound the the fundamental note of your snare drum so you want to kind of keep those under control um, and this range is also the range that gets a little like when you palm mute so usually what I'll do is I'll, I'll find the fundamental frequency of the snare and I'm just gonna I'm just gonna set it you know assume like 180 185 something like that for for our purposes and then I'll set a uh, a dynamic EQ right there or a multiband compressor just to bring those down when it chugs and what le that lets it do is um, when you're doing the gin, 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 like really chuggy stuff it keeps it from going and like tubbing out but when you're playing single notes those frequencies are still there because you you need those to make your single notes nice and fat um, so that it doesn't just sound like, uh, you know, fizzy, clacky nonsense. Um, but you want to control them when it's chugging. So that's why we don't do a hard EQ cut here, because if you're adding single note stuff in, it'll, it'll, it'll make it sound really thin and, and out of tune if you, uh, if you cut too much in here. Um, another thing that you can do is uh, do the same thing on, on just the low end. The guitars, uh, I mean, if you're tuned to C, right around like 65 hertz or so is going to be your your fundamental note everything under this is going to have been cut out in your framing eq stuff because that's just all going to be you know noise and rumble but uh, it can get a little bit out of control here in uh, areas that get a little bit a little bit busy and palm muting so if you're doing like a real like a real fast open uh c string chug along with the the bass you don't want that to tub out too much so you can do the same thing in the low frequencies and just bring that down so that it's only it's only compressing a little bit when you're chugging and that'll help clean that up and again when you get into the mix you'll have to go back in and adjust some of this but uh, those are just the areas you're going to want to look for the other instruments that you really want to look for that are um, the uh, the kick drum when you go into double bass parts you get a whole lot of low end build up and that can tub those out big time so that's really useful there um, also for the uh, the vocals, that same range um, right down here is going to be where your plosives are. They're going to be like when you're done, puh, 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 and there's a lot of those in uh, in death metal. So that's going to be under like 150 or so, but you don't want to lose 
the throatiness of the meat of your vocals in here so you don't want to necessarily cut all that with a hard EQ so I'll do a dynamic EQ like this and, and then just find find some uh, regular like low vocals and set the set the um, threshold of the EQ here so that it's just barely touching on those but then when you hit a plosive you'll see it just dive and then you screw around with the the release to uh, to try to get it sounding natural because if the release is too fast it sounds really weird next thing we're going to do is what I call the hard dynamics or the regular uh, dynamics just the, the full frequency range stuff um, that's to, to get the the evens the levels nice and even and consistent and um, to keep everything nice and punchy and in your face in the mix and keep everything behaving. The main areas that you're going to be worried about with that are in, in metal. Uh, the vocals specifically are the most important. Second most important is controlling the bass. Uh, I'd say third most important is, is keeping the snare in check. Um, then after that is the kick and uh, things that you don't really need to compress unless there's a problem going on are like the the vocals and the overheads and and that type of thing you should be able to leave them alone unless something goes really wonky uh then you can mess with those but um the vocals are very heavily compressed in in death metal music for the the growling stuff so to get it nice and even so you can hear all the little utterances um you're going to go through several stages of compression um which is it's better to do it that way than to use one big compressor with a really high ratio and just squash the crap out of it um, because it just doesn't sound natural that way and it ends up it ends up being pumpy and you lose syllables so anyway um, I have Jason's vocal soloed out here and um, you can hear that they're nice and consistent there um, I have it set through a couple different stages of compression. So the first one I have right here is a peak compressor, just to just to catch the the uh, the big peaks and keep them from screwing up the slower compressors later on. So it's set real fast. I have the attack down as low as it'll go. RMS is, is uh, set to peak, and then I have the release like 10 milliseconds or so, like 8 to 12 milliseconds, something like that. Um, and that's just going to kick in down here just on the peaks so it'll cut like between three and six decibels off just the peaks and really loud stuff it might peak up a little bit over uh, 6 db but you don't want to squash it too much with that um, since it's such a quick release otherwise it, it starts sounding a little bit pumpy and weird uh, the second stage i go through is a little bit slower um, this this is like classic vocal compressor settings uh soft knee four to one ratio um, whereas the peak compressor was like 10 to one it's almost a limiter um, it's real severe. Uh, this has a, a slightly longer RMS length, so it'll, it'll sense a little bit longer to see what it's supposed to compress. And then the release is set um, pretty quick, but in time with the music. Um, if you have a compressor with a program-dependent release, meaning that it's it's slower for the uh, the louder utterances and quicker for the, the uh, quieter ones, you could do that. Um, I have this set in time with the music. Um, I think like 47 milliseconds was uh, was a duration of a musical note uh, that was relevant here so that when it releases it uh, it pumps on a note and doesn't pump between notes and sound really weird. Uh, the third compression I have going on is even slower than that. So I have that to set to pick up where the other one releases and then uh, smear that release a little bit more with a pretty pretty gradual ratio so this one's this one's just smoothing things out uh, a, a little bit more it's keeping levels in check from section to section as opposed to utterance to utterance um, and making that sound a little bit more natural so it, that's really this is for the sake of the the screaming parts and when you get to the growls uh, it's not going to cut it down as much so the sections sound more even evening there's a little bit less mixer automation that you have to do later on and then I have it set to some uh, program dependent uh, limiters here and I have those cutting a couple decibels off each of these and then there's a safety clipper at the end 
So that's just for any peaks that are uh, above the max that manage to make their way through. Um, because I, I can't seem to find a compressor that's fast enough to catch those. I have a clipper, so it just it just hard clips those the little initial like ka pa. If you have a, like a hard consonant that comes in at the beginning of a loud phrase. Next thing we're going to talk about is complementary EQ, and that just means you're finding each instrument's space in the spectrum of the mix and making sure that nothing is interfering with the important frequencies. <coughs> The main areas you're going to want to look for will be making sure the guitars don't stomp on the vocals. So you want to find the vocal fundamental frequencies and then cut those a little bit in the guitar, maybe boost them a little bit more in the vocals. Um, and then you want to make sure that the uh, the snare and the, the guitars aren't fighting with each other in the lower mids and um, the kick and the bass aren't fighting with each other. So those are all things you're going to look for. What I like to do is um, I'll take uh, something like, where are we? Where is my, there, there's the kick. I'll take, go back to span again and um, solo out the instrument like the kick here. And you see our, our fundamental there is around 80. We've cut everything under 40 by now. And uh, right around here is where we want the kick drum to be sitting. The bass is going to be sitting a little bit below it right here, and the guitars are going to sit a little bit above it in this section here. Um, we have our snare in here. Our toms are going to go from guitar range past snare range. Um, the the uh, clacky attack part of our bass is going to be in the middle here. There will be a big scoop for the guitars with a big hump for the vocals because there's a lot of meat of the metal vocals between like, you know, 250 and, and six or 700 or so. Um, a little bit higher if you're doing like barky hardcore vocals. And then you're going to have a little peak in your bass from somewhere between like 750 and 1K. Um, then you have the kind of honky frequency of the guitar that you'll have to mix mess around with and then all of the the upper harmonics here which is just a nightmare in and of itself but basically the uh, attack of the toms is going to be right around here um, you're going to look for the scratchiness of your guitars in this range here and a little bit above that is going to be the, the presence of your vocals. A little bit above that is going to be the, the snap attack of the, uh, of the um, strainer on your snare drum. And then the kick drums here and anything above that is upper harmonics of uh, like reverb decay or um, your, all your cymbals are going to be up in there. And uh, it's some snare stuff will be in there too, but not, not quite as much. Now we're going to start to get into the level mix. <clears throat> what you want to do is find your instruments that are going to be um, up front in your face, and you're going to set them as a max level, and nothing goes above that. So that's useful because you can use it as a reference in the mix and say, okay, whatever this is, this is my 0 dB, and everything has to stay below that. So if I can't hear the guitars or something like that, um, or I can't hear that important instrument, um, instead of boosting that important instrument, you're going to cut everything else until you can hear that one. And that'll kind of keep you honest so that you don't run into the problem that you'll have often, which is like, oh, I can't hear the guitars, so you turn up the guitars. Oh, I can't hear the bass, so you turn up the bass. Oh, now I can't hear the vocals, so you turn up the vocals. So anyway, for the Solomors recording, um, the mix is very vocal-centric. So the vocals, the main vocals, are going to be the loudest thing in the mix. So right here where it says 3 dB, nothing is going to go over that for any significant amount of time. Everything else is going to be under it. Um, usually, in uh, traditionally, the kick is what you base everything around. Nothing is louder than the kick. Um, that kind of flip-flops with the snare every once in a while. Uh, like I said, we made this very vocal-centric, so the, uh, the vocals are the, the reference point for your mix. Um, and then everything else is just pulled down accordingly. This next section is going to be a real glib overview. It's um, tone sculpting EQ, and th this is really the 
these are the hard and subjective parts. Uh, it's also very time consuming and requires a lot of listening. There's not too much too much I can do to go into this in a short video, but um, the basics of it are um, you want to fix any mix problems you have in here remaining. So any any mic position problems you might have, if the vocalist is swallowing the mic and you have a whole lot of proximity effect, like building up your low end and making it woofy, you want to go through and cut that out a little bit. Or if you're using like a real a real warm mic and you want a little more presence, you have to go in and cut a little bit of low end out of that. Um, for guitars, it might be if you have a weird like resonant peak in the low end of your your cabinet when you mic that up that, that gets weird when you're like chugging notes you could go in and cut that um little problem frequency buildups like you know you're if you have a really busy double kick part and uh it tends to dominate the mix on some sections and you might want to go in and cut that frequency out um also if you don't have enough snap on your snare drum you're going to boost that and your your toms and all, all that stuff goes in here and i, I don't have a time to, to go into all the the basics but um or all the details but as far as the basics um for death metal type stuff i usually don't touch the vocal eq at all except to add a little bit of presence and to control the the low end and i really only do that so that i can tweak it and keep it consistent from song to song so this is the basic frame out of the eq on jason's vocals um it has a gradual roll off under like 100 or 120 or something like that um, it could even go down as far as 80 if they have a real deep voice. Um, but uh, that's just for the woofiness. And then I have a little bit of roll off up on the top here uh, just to keep any any weirdness from uh, interfering with the, the vocal or the, uh, the cymbals up there. As far as like the meat of the EQ, um, this is how I have it set up with with uh, Jason's voice it's kind of a gradual thing here I want it to be a little bit present in there but not honky so I take that out a little bit and then bring it back up here so my meat of my guitars is here and my meat of my snare is here and the low part of the vocals is right in the middle and then below that is where it starts building up with the uh, the uh, the kick the toms and the the bass so this area I try to keep a little bit cleaner um, this area right here is where the the main tone of the vocals is going to be and i try not to mess with that you see there's like a a kind of a gradual scoop there because the uh the um where they recorded it their mic ended up re being really warm so to get to the phrase is nice and articulate i had to take a little bit of that out and then boost a little bit up here in the the this is the presence up here this is just for the the ambient sparkle on the sibilance um to make it sound a little bit more glittery and then this is your your high end right here around i took it up around 5k it's where it kind of sounded best to me it can be it can be lower like much lower down here or, or a little bit higher um that's just where it, it kind of sounded best where it sat well with the the clack of the kick drum and the the uh peak of the snare drum that's up high uh, but yeah as far as the vocals uh those are those are the only little things i might do um, I also don't like to touch the guitars at all. I'd rather go back and re-mic or re-amp the guitars than go in and try to fix it with EQ because the more you mess with the guitars EQ, the more they kind of sound plastic. And uh, a lot of people like the really super processed, um, like uber tight guitar sound these days. Uh, I'm a little bit old school. I, I like it to be a little bit more natural and, and raunchy and, and uh, I like it crunchy but not super inhuman tight so i might go through and th this is the only eq that's on the guitars so i kind of did that to emulate a the um resonant curve of like a pull tech so it goes up a little bit and then cuts out the fizz up top and then this wolfing at the bottom is gone but if there's a little peak at the cabinet resonance at like 90 hertz or so and then i put a bigger peak up here at like 140 ish um because it was kind of a, a a little lull there the the bass was the top end of the bass was kind of like or the, the top end of the bass frequencies of the bass guitar was right up in here and then this the snare didn't kick in till here so i kind of boosted it up in that area just a little bit um and then i i listened to that solo out with the snare and then when they started fighting with each other i'd, I'd take it down a little bit 
Um, the second part of this is if you have something like the guitars that are panned left and right and you want them to sound wider, um, do complementary EQ cuts and boosts on each side. So the left side guitars I have cut at 160 and I have boosted at 3K, just like a decibel and a half, not very much. And then I did the opposite on the other sides. So, so my uh, um, left guitars are, you know, cut and then boosted, and then the right guitars are boosted and then cut, and that that kind of gives you the impression that it's a little bit wider. Um, also, to get width, you want different sounding guitars on each side. So when I reamped them, I used different guitar left than I did right, um, and I also use different amp settings left and right. And that all kind of makes it sound wide. There are artificial wideners, and I use a little bit of that on the master, but not very much because it makes it sound like, uh, you know, your guitar is on a stage that's, you know, 200 feet wide or something like that. Um, it's also something you have to watch out with the overheads. You don't want to push them too far out to the sides because then it just sounds unnaturally big and splashy. And, you know, like I said, some people like that um, in the modern metal context uh, they like it sounding big and wide and polished and unnatural I like this to make things sound a little bit more natural um, so I try to do all the widening that I can with with EQs and uh, avoid any unnatural widening if I can or I'll use just just a hint at the end to kind of like glue the wide stuff together So now that everything's set on your tracks, you're going to turn to the buses, and <clears throat> I'll use the drum bus as an example, but um, all of my drums are submixed to this fader right here so I can control the overall drum level. And to glue them together a little bit, I used um, this guy. This is a, a program-dependent attack and release compressor, and it's real simple to use, just input-output. And I'm basically just shaving a couple decibels you can see how the the needles barely moving here just to just to kind of glue everything together um, and then I followed that up with a non frequency dependent uh, or non program dependent compressor that sat real slow um, in time with the music the attack and release with a, a long RMS there and a real slight ratio and again that's just to that's just to even it out from section to section and then I used a, a brick wall just as a uh, emergency thing all the way at the end, um, just in case you have like a tom roll with like a, a couple errant hits that are super loud. You know, with that tripping out your master compressor when you get to the mastering stage. Um, and then also you're going to do your final EQing here. So this EQ right here on the drum bus looks a little bit weird, but uh, what I did was there were peaks in the vocals right here. And right here and then there was a lull in the vocals right here so I cut these where the vocal peaks were so that the overall drums wouldn't interfere with the vocals um, and that that's the kind of stuff you're doing there so you have complementary track EQ in the individual tracks and we do the buses um, I bust each of the instruments and do a complementary EQ there um, and this is also where you're gonna put your uh, if you're gonna do saturation and uh, like a enhancer or something like that and SK bright is a it's a, a high-end enhancer um, or exciter I guess is what they call it um, so you can use that there um, and your saturation which is use something like this this is another freebie from Klanghelm um, or like uh, I think I, I use real bus for a couple other things which is it's pretty nice it's it's a uh, it's cheap too. It's like, I think it's like twelve bucks or something like that. It's a it's a tape emulator. And it's it's pretty useful for gluing the stuff together and, and saturating it so that the the low end sounds um, sounds coherent and uh, thick and the things don't sound like they're standing out on their own. Um, if you don't use saturation, a lot of times you'll have the effect of whatever is loudest and brightest sounds like it's riding on top of everything else as opposed to sitting with it. Um, that's really tough, especially in metal vocals, because your uh, your vocals are real compressed and in your face, uh, and even and loud. And you don't want them to sound like they're surfing on top of the music. You want it to sound like you're singing with the band. Um, so you'll saturate that a little bit to get it to get it to sit in there. 
Now we're going to get into effects a little bit. And with effects, there, there aren't really hard and fast rules um, like with other things. It's kind of to taste. Uh, Jason wanted his vocals pretty wet, so I left a whole lot of room for vocal effects. And everything else is pretty dry except for the snare and the guitar solos. Um, the guitar solos and the lead vocals I treat kind of the same. Uh, but I'll make the solos a little bit wetter so that it doesn't sound like uh, uh, they're a little bit harder to get to sit properly in the mix um, than the vocals are. So you don't want those to sound too much like they're riding on top or in your face. I'll 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 put I'll I'll affect those out pretty good. Um, for Jason's vocals, I have uh, delay reverb and an, and another delay after that. That's that's pretty much it. And then I have a, a sub reverb that I set up. Um, which is just one fader with like an ambient reverb with a lot of the low end rolled off of it that you can bus the aux tracks to or individual tracks so that they kind of sound like they're all playing in the same room. You don't want a lot of that. You, you won't even be able to hear it in the mix. Like when you have something soloed out and you play and you adjust the levels, if you just hear a hint of it, that's, that's enough. That's all you need. Because uh, once you get into the mastering stage and you're, you're slamming the compression, um, that'll get really obvious if you have too much of it. Um, for delay, I have, uh, I have them set pretty quick here and pretty slow here to note values. And you see how little they're mixed in, like 1% half note going to the right and then 10% uh, of the quicker one going to the other side. And that's just to help it, like I said, sit in the mix a little bit so that it doesn't sound really dry and demo-y. Um, you don't want to overdo that too much. You get, you know, really big, sloppy, weird sounding stuff, which is fine. You know, like a uh, strapping young lad and Devin Townsend project, like they do a lot of, a lot of delay stuff and he sends his delays out to uh, an EQ and sets them on, you know, infinite repeat and they just, they mush into infinity. And that sounds great for that style, but you might not want that if you're trying to do something that's, uh, um, that's not as big and wide as, as his stuff is. And like I said, there's another delay here. This is set uh, eighth note and quarter note, 1%, 1%, just a real little uh, going left and right just to give a little bit of motion. And I used a, a convolution reverb with a medium hall, like a medium wooden hall. Um, again, 5%, not mixed in very much with a lot of the low end rolled out of it so that it doesn't tub out. And I have that all the way up at 318 hertz. It'll get real nasty if you have too much low end in your reverb. Um, and then a delay, and I think the ambient reverb I used was just like a, a medium guitar plate reverb or something like that. Um, the snare reverb is the the other thing that's going to get a whole lot of stuff. Um, for the snare, I usually use two reverbs, and I'm just using Freeverb because it's pretty awesome and it's cheap. It sounds cheesy by itself, but in the mix, it sounds pretty good. Uh, if you use a big, thick, rich, like convolution reverb, like a hall or something, uh, it it can get really sloppy, and your your uh, s snare reverb uh, ends up mushing out a whole bunch of the stuff. You'll you'll run into problems with your your keyboards and your cymbals. So anyway, the first one I have set fairly small, so that's like a room, and then the second one I have well I have this backwards. Anyway, th this is set to kind of a room, and then the other one is set a lot bigger. I'll have that at like you know. 0.8 or 0.9, um, and then mix them in accordingly. These happen to be the same level, but that's not necessarily the case. Uh, I also have them delayed a little bit by like 17 milliseconds so that they don't interfere with the initial hit and decay of the fundamental. Um, so usually that's going to be between like 10 and 25 milliseconds or so, depending on the music and uh, how busy the snare parts are. But for this song, 17 seemed to be the best to let it kind of like have a nice dry attack and then let the reverb bloom in a little bit. And I, I don't have a lot of snare reverb on this track, just enough to make it not sound, you know, like I said, demo-y. Um, but that's what's going to help make your, your snare drum sit in there and not sound really mechanical like it's sitting on top. I also uh, EQ the snare pretty hard before it gets into the reverb. So th this EQ curve just applies to the reverb. You see how much low end I cut out. There's a shelving filter there and then you know real hard high pass filter here and a more gradual one for the for the high end stuff because you really just want to catch the, the meat of it. And then for the smaller reverb I have a little bit more high end content and much more aggressive cut down here so that's kind of be your your kind of pre-reflections in your room and then you have your 
your main reverb up here that's a lot of a lot more um of the meat of the instrument that's that's uh, gonna bloom a little bit after the initial hit um things that i always keep totally dry kick no effects on the kick ever um toms they get bust out to the snare reverbs and they're treated a lot like the snare because you're not usually going to be hitting your snare and your toms at the same time so i put them in the same space um i don't really put you can see i don't have anything on the overheads um sometimes i'll put a little bit of ambient reverb on the overheads um if a whole lot of the room came through in the mics and the room sounds really small and boxy i'll do that to make it sound like it's a bigger more expensive drum room but a lot of times you won't even have to worry about that if you go too crazy with reverb on the overheads they just end up uh sounding like swishy messes and the last thing i'm going to cover is uh, master bus effects and this isn't for the mastering this is just for listening back purposes and you should be able to toggle these on and off um the reason for that is things you want to be able to hear relatively what it's going to sound like when it's mastered and things get a little bit more compressed and, and uh, brick walled. Um, so I will set those in a, a general a general chain. It looks like an EQ that sort of frames everything out like that. Um, this was specific to this song, but uh, it ended up being a little bit too bright. So I did a real gradual thing and then just kind of cut everything out around like you know 20 hertz or so it looks more severe than it is but uh then i send it to um a couple different compressors and these are all barely on compressors so they're going to shave like a decibel or two off each not too much um i used uh airwind is logical as like a barely on compressor that's a pretty nice plug in it's like 50 bucks i think um M compressor, you can see I set this a little bit slower, so that's set 42, 45 release and a real gradual ratio. And like I said, that's just going to shave. That's that's barely even going to blip up here onto zero decibels. Um, and then you can do a uh, a slow compressor after that to kind of glue every, the sections together. Um, so you can cut a couple decibels off, like no more than three and have a real slow release time uh, set to a note value like a half note or a whole note or something like that um, and if you're uh, if you have real weirdness from section to section you can even set it a whole lot longer like five or ten seconds or something like that um, so if you pop out of something and into something else um, it'll it'll gradually rise to the volume that's coming back in uh, after that I use a little bit of saturation and exciting so I'll use uh, I use real bus there and this will just barely blip up into seven um, that's just to make the the low end of the mix sound a little bit more coherent um, some surgical EQ after that maybe to take care of some problem areas I you had a boost up there because I was losing the the low end of the kick in the snare or whatever um, any spatial effects you want um, if you're if you do want to go with like a super wide sounding recording your, uh, when you push things out to the side with like a with like a um, like a Haas effect spatializer or something like that it's going to have the effect of making this every all the instruments that are on the side sound louder than everything in the middle obviously so you could all of a sudden lose your vocals and your snare your kick and your bass and have your guitars and your cymbals and toms be really loud so you want to have that when you're monitoring you could toggle on and off to check those levels so that you don't end up screwed when you when you print the mix to send it off to, to the master and then um, your brick wall goes at the end of that so I have uh, this is another freebie from Melda Productions uh, I have that with some a little bit of saturation there and uh, that's just gonna bring it up to I have it set to um, bring it up to minus 9 DB which is uh, reasonably quiet for metal recordings but that's hot by traditional standards and then you can just go you know when you're when you're listening back just mute those on and off or all the different effects or, or set it on like a parallel bus and like mute it on and off so that you can do your mix then listen to the what it's going to sound to master do your mix go back to what it's going to sound to master etc etc and then turn all those off when you print your mix to send off to be mastered Rise with your own In your dream state of calm 